as we all know, there's uh, there's no policy without politics. So uh, we need to hear about that too. And and there's really um, no one I think uh, we'd rather hear from about it than this gentleman, Professor Bob Huckfeld, who not only is a member of the National Academy of Arts and Sciences and distinguished professor of political science at UC Davis, author of numerous books and lots and lots of articles about all kinds of intriguing topics, but he's also former director of UC Center Sacramento and a current member of our advisory board. So we're really privileged to have you here with us today, Bob, Thank and we're, Thank you. we're very glad that you can speak to us about dueling populists and the political ecology of 2016. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. I, I uh, have an investment, a couple of us have investments in uh, the UC Center, and uh, it's always nice to come back and, and be here again. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the 2016 election uh, today, and in particular, sort of the different kind of populist appeals we saw that came out of the election and out of the, out of the campaigns. Um, this is, though, in the context of a larger project that I'm working on with a colleague of mine, Eric Engstrom, at uh, UC Center, or I'm, I'm sorry, UC Davis. Um, and Eric and I are sort of worried and about and working on the problem of social welfare policy in the United States and, and how we ended up in a situation where um, you know, it isn't as supported as a lot of people think it ought to be, and um, what makes America different in terms of social welfare policy. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that today when we talk about um, the Affordable Care Act. So I want to start out with a couple of quotations. The first quotation is one from um, a speech that uh, Chuck Schumer gave to, uh, at the National Press Club on November 25th, 2014. And for those of you with good memories, that was uh, right after uh, the midterm election in which uh, uh, the Republicans uh, did very well. And it was, in a certain sense, a repudiation at least Schumer believes it was a repudiation of the Affordable Care Act. And let me read this for you. Democrats blew the opportunity the American people gave them in 2008. Only a third of the uninsured or even registered to vote. In 2010, only about 40% of those registered voted. So even if the uninsured kept with the rate, which they likely did not, we would still only be talking about 5% of the electorate. Now I have some numbers that we can verify those against from the Kaiser Family Foundation, as well as the Cooperative uh, Congressional Election Study. He's not far off. If anything, he's a little conservative. Okay, um, To aim a huge change in mandate at such a small percentage of the electorate made no political sense. Now, this is the same Chuck Schumer that's going to the mat to support ACA and doing everything he can to you know, resurrect ACA and, and keep it safe. Um, and then there's, but, but that reflects a particular kind of populism. And I think we have to understand contemporary populism inside the Democratic Party in a in the context of the larger political coalition that Democrats have put together. The second um, um, quotation comes from a different, uh, different political personality, our current president. Um, and it was right after he won the Nevada primary. And he said, we won with the poorly educated. I love the poorly educated, end of quote. So I guess what I want to do today is to think a little bit harder about these different populist impulses in contemporary American politics and try to understand them a little bit better. Um, but let's back up just a second um, uh, to a debate that really began in, or a discussion that began in 1975 when Arthur Oaken, and maybe before actually, when Arthur Oaken wrote his book, Equality and Efficiency, The Big Trade-Off. Um, Arthur Oaken was a um, world-class economist. There's an Oaken effect that's you know, attributed to him in economic textbooks. He was a Yale professor. He was uh, on the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, and he ended up at Brookings and died young. Um, but before he died, he wrote this book. And the book was really important for me because I was a new graduate student and I was reading this book. Institutions in a capitalist democracy prod us to get ahead of our neighbors economically after telling us to stay in line socially. The double standard professes and pursues an egalitarian political and social system while simultaneously generating gaping disparities in economic well-being. Well, the way he frames this, I mean, that's the, that's the fundamental contradiction in the way we live our lives. But what he was really framing this in was the it, it was at the nexus of that important trade-off that occurs between equality and efficiency in a democratic political system. It's important because there are really two wills, two ways to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. 
right? One way is to extinguish free markets that sort of generate the prosperity that we need for the society. But the other way is to concentrate wealth in a way that undermines the capacities of a democratic electorate. So somehow, that's what we should be talking about. We should be talking about that great trade-off because it's fundamental to politics and it's fundamental to democratic political system. But the last 40 years since Oaken identified the big trade-off uh, suggests that equality is losing out in the great, uh, in the great consideration. This is uh, data from Piketty and Saez, okay? And it's about top incomes in the Great Recession, recent evolutions in policy implications. Uh, Piketty has a book now on inequality. It's a big tome, okay? But um, the really crucial stuff comes in this, this article. This shows the, the top figure shows the top, the total income, um, total national income going to the top 1%, uh, top 10%, okay? And so what you see is this, I know this is a little small for you, but this is right up to the recession, okay? So the recession ends about right here. And you see right in the aftermath of the, this is 1942, after the Great Recession, there's this huge deconcentration of wealth, okay? So up here, uh, the top 10%, Controlled, uh, you know, between 40 and 50 percent of all the wealth in the country. Okay, then that bottomed out because basically because a lot of capital became worthless. Okay, and people just lost their shirts, and so then we skittered along at 35 percent during this period. Now this makes it look like this is a bad period, right? But some people would argue that was the heyday of American democracy, right? It started uh, basically uh, sort of right around World War II when we started like producing like crazy and people had jobs and there was full employment and all kinds of things were going on. And it kept on going all the way out until about 1982, 19, between that 77 to 82 period. And then it starts climbing again, okay, in terms of the percentage of, of total income controlled by the top, um, by the, um, the richest folks, okay. Um, and so now we're back up to where we were Okay, before the recession, all right? Now this is the same thing. You may be wondering how much of this is capital gains and how much of this is like real income as opposed to capital gains. This separates the two and you can see the two take the same path basically, all right? So the lesson from Piketty, who's a French economist, is that in fact uh, um, we have this incredible maldistribution of wealth inside the country, um, that we had this long period of time in which that was not the case, but it's become the case again. So the question, I guess, is what happened to the populace? Where were they? Were they asleep at the switch back here when all this was going on? I mean, during a large part of that time, uh, there were Democrats in the White House, so why, why did this happen? Here's a quote from uh, Carl Elliott. Carl Elliott was the first winner of the Profiles and Courage Award um, from the Kennedy Center. Um, he was a congressman, a white congressman in North Alabama in the late 1940s and up through the Real through the 1950s, uh, he was the um, floor. Um, he, he he ran things on the floor. He was the floor director for the uh, consideration of the National Defense Education Act in the mid 1950s. That was the first time the federal government agreed to send uh, federal funds to state and local education. Um, he had this stellar social welfare record, um, and he ends up getting crosswise with George Wallace later on in his uh, um, time in office and ultimately gets forced out of politics. And here's his quote from his book. As the civil rights movement began to take shape, the integration of school, with the integration of schools as a primary focus, segregationists realized that the end of separate but equal school systems was coming soon, which meant that federal aid to white school children would include federal aid to black ch school children as well. The segregationists were perfectly willing to sacrifice the futures of millions of poor white children to make sure that blacks were held down, okay? So his, his uh, prognosis or his diagnosis of the problem was that basically once that social welfare state started to become something other than a white social welfare state, it started having problems surviving. Now this is a, um, th th there's, a there's an old saw in uh, political science that I take a little bit of issue with, and that is if you don't like your congressman, change congressman, because you'll never change your congressman's mind, okay? The congressman and senators never change, okay? They vote the way they vote, and if you want to have something different, you got to get rid of the old one and get a new one. Well, this says something different, and I'm not, these were extraordinary circumstances, but this is 1947, 
And these are um, 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 ADA scores. ADA scores are Americans for Democratic Action. It was a liberal group, and they rated, they gave people scorecards on how well they did um, on the issues that ADA thought were important. And these are percentile rankings. So it's like what percentile you're in, where um, it's sorted by the 1947 uh, score. So we have, up here, we have the most conservative. Happy O'Daniel was the most conservative senator in the Senate. By the way, we get the same results. They're, they're more sophisticated um, uh, scaling technologies you can use to do this, but you get the same results. It doesn't matter what you use. So O'Daniel was the most conservative, and then we go all the way down to the bottom to Claude Pepper. He was the most liberal in 1947, okay? So what we do is we follow the Senate seat through time and look at how things had changed by 1967. So this is 22 senators, 22 Senate seats from the 11 states of the Confederacy over time. So what you see up here, where you can particularly see it down here, because these are the liberal guys, right? So look what, and then this is their score 20 years later. Now sometimes the seat changes and sometimes it doesn't. So right here we've got John Sparkman uh, in 1947 and John Sparkman in 1967, but Clyde Pepper disappeared uh, way long ago, and so there's George Mathers was in there instead by 1967. But still, this was these were the liberal seats in the in the in the U.S. Senate from the South. And I first want to draw your attention to the fact that there were liberal seats in the U.S. Senate from the South in the late 1940s. But now look at what happened to their scores. These are percentile dra drops, right? 72 points, okay? 54, 65, 65, 34. I mean, it's a disaster. The average drop is a third of the scale, okay, for the Senate during this period of time. So what happened? Well, if you believe uh, the quote I just gave you from our northern Alabama congressman, once it became the case that we were responding to all the citizens, not just the white citizens. And once it became the case that social welfare programs had to embrace um, diverse racial groups, it sort of changed the whole orientation of southern populace okay, in these southern states. And what happened instead then was they started voting no on a lot of these issues. Now, there were some genuine heroes in here. And I want to, you know, it's easy to sort of say, oh, these guys were a bunch of hypocrites and bad guys. And, and they, their behavior, you know, I, it speaks for itself. But I want to sort of draw your attention to who some of these people were, in particular the two Alabama senators. Lister Hill was a um, son of a prominent um, surgeon in the South, one of the most prominent surgeons in the South. His, I, I always wondered why a Southern senator had a name like Lister. Did his father not know how to spell Lester, and so they called him Lister, okay? But in fact, this Southern... Uh, surgeon trained under Robert Lister, who was the inventor of, of um, antiseptic surgery, um, and named his son uh, Lister after that surgeon. Okay, so we're talking about you know some substantial people. Lister Hill. There's a there's an institute at the National Institutes of Health named Hill Institute, and that's named after Lister Hill because Lister Hill was an incredible supporter of public health research and public health inside the U.S. Senate. Um, John Sparkman was, you know, I, I knew John Sparkman, not personally, but I knew of him when I was uh, worried about going to Vietnam, okay, because he was a big supporter of the Vietnam War. But he was also a huge supporter of labor in, in, in Birmingham and the rest of the South. These guys, you know, except for civil rights, these guys had liberal records. They, that they were the Southern populace, and in fact, the state of Alabama was one of the most populous states in the country, okay? Um, that all changes, though. With the advent of civil rights, and now with the recognition of diversity and the rights of a diverse nation, we have people bailing on their positions vis-a-vis -vis prior, their prior positions. So in the 2016 election, we really ended up with three populists running. And part of what I want to, you know, you're, I'm reading a lot of learned material these days, and, and people just sort of take out the word awful and put in the word populist. Like, all populists are awful, okay? And I sort of want to try to convince that part of the a subtext here is you've got to be careful when you look at populists. There are different kinds of populists. Now, the idea of a populist is that you sort of embrace the common people and you look for programs that help common people, you know, the ordinary citizens in the country, right? Now, there's a really prominent book around now that's just sort of lambasting populism and saying, no, we don't want populism, we want liberal democracy. 
Well, there's, a, there's some problems with liberal democracy, right? To make liberal democracy work, you have to get organized. And you have to have groups that represent your interests. Well, part of the problem with large groups of people is they have a hard time getting organized. So there's never been a successful poor people's movement that's hired high-flying attorneys to represent their interests in Washington. They just don't get that done. It's a collective action problem in which there are just too many poor people to be able to put to, and they're too poor, to put together a large organization that actually represents their interests effectively. The same way, for example, the National Association of Manufacturers are able to put together a group that does that sort of thing. So populist movements are, are, have a hard time playing ball in a liberal democracy if it means that they have to get organized, because getting organized is almost an insurmountable um, uh, task. Well, we had three populists, right? All of them presented and employed populist appeals, but they all three had very, very different visions of their job, their task, and their vision of the future. Um, Bernie Sanders was a democratic socialist, self-identified. Hillary Clinton was a Wall Street friendly advocate for sort of traditional democratic constituencies. And the Republican primaries really became this race between Donald Trump and everybody else, and everybody else lost and Donald Trump won. Um, and Donald Trump's harder to describe. I can describe Hillary and, and, uh, um, and Bernie easier than I can describe uh, uh, the politics of Donald Trump. But he had a populist appeal. You know, he was reaching out for all the people that didn't, you know, that he claimed weren't being treated appropriately. So the Democratic electorate was not ready for a Democratic socialist. The traditional Republicans lose control of the primaries, and then we end up with two very different populist candidates in the 2016 presidential race. Um, so American populists come in one sort of category, but there are in fact many species of American populists. Um, socialism and social democratic parties have never really caught on in the United States. Uh, and the American Democratic Party is less committed to a social welfare state than, for example, the more conservative of the two major parties in Germany, the social, social uh, uh, I mean, the Christian Democratic Party. Uh, so, you know, it, the, the more conservative party in Germany is more liberal with respect to social welfare policy than the more liberal uh, of the two parties in the United States. Uh, there were socialist mayors in um, uh, uh, Milwaukee. There have been a socialist party in, in the United States. Um, the Democratic Socialists in America currently have about 35,000 members. Not enough to start a movement quite yet, OK? Um, so the point is we've never sort of turned the corner on sort of social democracy or socialism. Um, we do, however, have this sort of post-Civil War politics and history of white political violence, mostly in the South, um, that was a real, in, in a sense, was a you know, wrong-headed, evil, populist uprising. There are a couple of really great books out on this now. Uh, if anybody is so inclined, the Chernow book on, um, on Grant has a long, long section just devoted to Grant and Reconstruction. It's a terrific read if you haven't had an opportunity. The other great books are by Eric Foner. Foner has some terrific sort of accounts. There, he has one book that's a tome and really hard, okay, but another book is shorter and easier and, and, and compelling about how that all worked out. So it was sort of, if you will, populi populism infused with racism run amok. Um, Northern Democrats ultimately uh, coalesced with those Southern white segregationists because uh, tr uh, uh, Grant and his colleagues failed to get a foothold to the Republican Party in the South during Reconstruction. So we end up with this, you know, Democratic Party that uh, primarily depends on people like the folks I showed you, those liberal Democrats in Southern states. Now, the one way to think about this is different kinds of populisms, and one one kind of populism is this sort of regressive populism, which which really adopts a divide and conquer uh, strategy and, and plays the race card to mobilize the white electorate. Uh, there's some great sources on this. Uh, C. Van Woodward's account from 1938 of Tom Watson is still compelling reading. Uh, D. O. Key's account of Theodore Bilbo in Mississippi is, is similarly sort of the same sort of flavor of how race baiting took hold in the South and how it, it uh, you know, sort of reigned supreme. Uh, in fact, Tom Watson at one point was an active politician um, in Georgia politics, tried to put together a biracial coalition of poor people in Southern politics, and ultimately gave up and, 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 and became a race baiter himself. 
Um, but this regressive populism is all about dividing and conquering and playing the race card to mobilize the white population. Um, so Joseph Crespino has a 2012 account of Strom Thurmond of South Carolina. And Strom Thurmond's uh, reaching out to Barry Goldwater and making the Goldwater candidacy uh, compatible with Southern politics during that period. But closer to home, um, some of you may have grown up in Los Angeles like I did when Sam Yorty ran for uh, mayor against uh, Tom Bradley. Um, it was pretty nasty. Uh, it was pretty awful. I was going to bring the, uh, um, there's, a, there's a great uh, interview with Yorty during that presidential, or during that mayoral campaign. And I was going to bring it and show it to you, but I didn't trust my own technological abilities, so I decided not to bring it. But that's the website to go see the video of his interview and his allegations about the mayhem that Tom Bradley was going to produce. So again, one genus, many species. Then we have this other example of the way populism might work. And it's the New Deal and the progressive populist tradition. So in the context in which we're thinking about populists as race baiters, it's worth going back and looking at, at Roosevelt's speech at Madison Square Garden just a couple days before the 1936 election. He says, we had to struggle with the old enemies of peace, business and financial monopoly, speculation, reckless banking, class antagonism, sectionalism, war profiteering. They had begun to consider the government of the United States as a mere appendage to their own efforts and affairs. We know that government by organized money is just as dangerous as government by the mob. Never before in all history have these forces been so united against one candidate. And then he goes on to say, I should like to have it said of my first administration that in the forces of self-interest and of lust for power met their match. I should like to say of my second administration that, it, that in it these forces met their master. Um, those are harsh words, OK? We don't hear politicians using those kind of words. I don't think that's the speech Hillary gave when she went to Wall Street. You know, I, I think she had a different message for them. Um, so H.W. Brand has a book on uh, Roosevelt called A Traitor to His Class. And so the question is, was he really a traitor to his class? Um, or was he the ultimate defender of liberal democracy and American capitalism? How should we understand 2016, both in terms of Donald Trump, the guy who said we won with the poorly educated, I love the poorly educated, and in terms of Hillary Clinton and her relationship to an unfortunate statement, her basket of deplorables? Um, so some way, politics kind of ran off the rails in 2016. Um, the Democrats were worrying about the basket of deplorables, and the Republicans were embracing the, uh, the uh, um, poorly educated. So what are the lessons? Well, the first lesson is inequalities affect the American economy and American politics with profound implications for the American working and middle classes. The American electorate subject to manipulation on the basis of race and ethnic hostility. That's nothing new. But the failure really is not just anchored in the electorate and the candidates. Uh, it's also anchored in the failure of conventional candidates and parties who don't really respond to these anxieties. Some explanations that point to the xenophobic and racist attitudes in the electorate as the culprit, but there's something to be said for economic anxiety and its effect on all this. There's a prominent political scientist these days that's saying, hey, it's, it has nothing to do with economics. It's all just about anti, you know, anti-ethnic, anti-racial kind of animus among Americans. And that's a big part of it. But I think those Piketty results I showed you before, there's a reason why people should be anxious. Okay? I mean, there are, there are real palpable reasons economically why there's anxiety out there. And that kind of economic anxiety is the breeding ground for racist, xenophobic responses oftentimes. So I'm going to give you some data. I, what would be a political science presentation without data? So I mean, this is based on the 2016 Comparative Congressional Election Study, which is a nationally stratified online sample survey. That means that they have impaneled people who usually answer questions about you know, consumer preferences, et cetera. But they keep this huge pool, and they do complica complicated weighting after the fact to try to recover something that approximates a random sample of the American electorate. Um, I used to do a lot of telephone surveys. You cannot do telephone surveys anymore. They're dead in the water. And so this is, this is really kind of where we're at these days. So this, this, the common content, which is what we're going to use, of this survey was, is based on 50,000 respondents. So we've got lots and lots of respondents that are post-weighted to represent um, um, the country, as well as large uh, so this large sample size 
is combined with state and county identifiers so I can locate, locate people in, with the states and counties they live in. All right, so first let's talk a little bit about how the Democratic Party has changed and how American politics has changed. This is the percent of employed workers who are unionized um, in the United States uh, from 1930 to 2000. And what you'll see is that this is right during the period of time when the Fair Labor Standards was Act was passed and when the Wagner Act was passed and when all that labor legislation happened. And there's this huge spike upward. And then we get to the war years and the, there were some advantages to having organized workplaces and workforces. And so we peak out in terms of unionization at around you know, 25, between 25 and 30 percent in 1960. And then it starts to plummet. Now, that picture might remind you of a picture I showed you just a little bit before, okay, which is the inequality picture. So there's a real uh, inverse relationship between inequality and unionization in the country. Um, it's, it's more complicated than just that, but clearly there are things going on in terms of unionization and, and the distribution of income. Now, this has had huge profound consequences, not just simply some of these things are just natural uh, evolution of a society sort of thing. And, and so, for example, we started out uh, at the end of World War II with a large manufacturing workforce, okay, that's, that's only a shadow of its former self. And we've had this huge transformation that has seen categories of white professional managerial, white clerk and white clerical service sales occupations increase radically at the same time that working class occupations have declined radically. So what this gives, this is the National Election Study data over from 1952 to through 2004, and it gives you the composition of the Democratic coalition. So the question is, why is it the Democratic coalition, at, or why aren't Democratic candidates um, as aggressively populist as they used to be, okay, even outside the South? Well, what you see up here is the percentage of the Democratic electorate that's white working class. And you see that course downward. It starts up about 43%. It courses downward, downward, downward. And we end up at the end of the period by about, at about 20%. Um, African Americans, after, uh, particularly after they get the vote, start voting for the Democratic Party. They had voted Republican before, you know, for long periods before, particularly if we get back earlier in the period. In 1960, for example, I think about 30% of African Americans voted for Richard Nixon. All right, so there was still strong ties to the Republican Party at that time. But now the, the African American coalition, or the African American population provides as much as the white working class population does to the, to the Democratic vote. Um, and these, the green line here is other non white groups. And what am I missing here? Why isn't that? Oh, and, oh, and this is the most interesting one for me, maybe, is the white professional managerial class. These were like 1930 Republicans, right? And now they are tied with um, African Americans as being the most important component of the Democratic coalition. So why might it be the case that, uh, that the Democratic candidate for president might have been lulled into a sense of security that would allow her to call a large portion of the white working class a basket of deplorables? We kind of have ended up in a situation where the Democratic Party isn't really the party of the working class any longer. The, the, the really prominent features of the Democratic coalition are much more likely to be members of the white professional managerial class or to be um, part of, of ethnic and racial minority groups inside the country. So we have a very, very different complexion that we're looking at in the context of current Democratic Party politics and national politics. Now this gives you the two-party vote for Trump and Clinton by race, party, and born-again identification. Um, so up here we see, can you see my pointer? Yeah, there you go. Okay, so after, uh, Trump gets a majority of the white vote, okay? And you heard quite a bit about this in the election. Um, you know, he won the white vote. But in fact, um, the Republicans have been winning the white vote in the country since 1964, okay? Uh, 1964 was the last time the Democratic presidential candidate had a majority of white voters supporting him. So, you know, things are changing. Things have changed the Democratic Party. Um, he also, uh, now clearly it was, the, the election was incredibly polarized by uh, party, uh, more so than you would normally expect. Um, and born again status, there's a lot of press about it, but in fact it's not, uh, 
you know, it's, it's significant, but it's in as much as um, it's not as stunning as some of these other differences. Um, now, here's the one I want to spend a little time on. Okay, this is a measure of economic pessimism. It, it's a, like three different questions that get asked to people on the survey, and um, so you end up with a 13-point scale. Uh, these are the people that are economically optimistic, and they all vote for Clinton almost. Okay, but as economic pessimism increases, 90% at the at the extreme report voting for Trump. Now. Um, I don't want to say this is just economics, all right? Because again, people scapegoat on all kinds of things. But certainly, economics is part of this mix. Uh, there's a large part of the population that's not that's not optimistic, <clears throat> uh, and you can see the percentages, sample percentages along the bottom. It's fairly, you know, it's it's kind of a uni not a uniform distribution, but it's not a big hump in the middle of that distribution. You know, it goes from one percent, one percent, three gets up to the peak of 18, 19, 14 in there, and then comes back down again. So you really have you know, a third of the population at the low end, a third of the population at the high end, and the majority is kind of in the middle, or close to a majority in the middle. Now, in terms of supporting or the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, um, you know, it's an incredible indicator of who you're going to vote for. right? If you support the repeal, you voted Republican. All right, so um, <clears throat> how am I doing? I think I'm going to jump over this because I have other data on this. Um, what I have here for you now is a uh, table that uses sort of a regression model, a logistic regression model, and I'm not going to bore you with sort of reading the coefficients. Well, what I want to do instead is take you over to this, actually these two columns. And so the column, third column over there that at the top, it says 0.26 to 0.78. That means that people who supported, with taking account of all these other factors, race, uh, family income, education, economic anxiety, all those things. People who favored the um, repeal of ACA, or who, who opposed the repeal of ACA, uh, that on average voted 26% for Trump. But if they favored the repeal, it went up to 78% for Trump. Okay? So that's a change of 0.52 in the probability of supporting Trump. When you come on down, though, you see, well, okay, uh, if you're way at the low end of that 13 point economic anxiety scale, 7% voted for Trump. At the top of that scale, 93% voted for Trump for an 86% difference. The only other comparable one is party ID. Okay, So party ID from strong Republican to strong Democrat uh, goes from 0.09 to, well, I should say the other way, from strong Democrat to strong Republican goes 0.09 to 0.91 for um, Trump. So in point of fact, um, you know the things that really move the probability when you take account of all the other sort of factors that might have affected the probability, the big ones are the ACA repeal, economic anxiety, and partisanship, Okay, really driving the results of the election. Now, um, this does the same thing, but it does it just for, um, hold it, where am I? This is for, but it does it for the Affordable Care Act. And so for the Affordable Care Act, you see again that economic anxiety makes a substantial difference. 71 points. Uh, partisanship also makes a huge difference. And the other things sort of pale in comparison. So economically anxious Republicans are particularly likely, this is, this is, this is uh, the whole population, are particularly likely to, uh, support, the afford to uh, support the repeal. Now, you'll notice that when we go over to Latino, Asian, and African American, there aren't huge differences. Uh, you know, the, the, in fact, the, um, you know, it didn't have sort of overwhelming support among uh, ethnic communities either way. So there aren't huge differences there after taking account of everything else. Now, finally, last table, this is two party Trump support, but only among whites. Um, and the explanatory variables considered here are whether or not you want to repeal ACA, uh, economic anxiety, family income, education, partisanship, born again. Okay, but that's not really the point here. What I want to look at instead is where do these where do these people live? Where are they, and what difference does that make? So this is the effect here of the county uh, proportion that's Asian and Latino. Um, this is the state proportion Asian and Latino. This is the county proportion 
African American, and this is the state proportion African American. So what you'll see is that when you live in a county that's diverse, these are for white folks, when white folks live in diverse counties, they're less likely to support Trump, okay? But when they live in states that are more diverse, taking account of the county they live in, they're more likely to vote for Trump. Now you can write this off, I mean, there's a couple of ways to explain this, but I mean, what's compelling for me is that you're getting the same pattern of effect um, for the two different non-white um, uh, densities, you know, the, the county versus the state. Um, uh, in both instances. Um, and one way to explain it is just to say, well, that's just the Southern effect, okay? Because those states with high African-American populations in particular are likely to be Southern states, and so that's what's going on there, maybe, okay? Um, but what's particularly compelling for me are these county level effects. Looks to me like there's a vanguard of the American popu white population that has figured out that they can live in politically diverse counties and aren't particularly moved and, and shattered by the fact that that's where they live. And they're able to cope with that, and it doesn't really affect their politics as much. Uh, but there are other populations that are clearly embedded in, in, in environments that probably um, are partly responsible for seeing these sort of uh, positive effects at the, at the um, uh, state level on you know, if, in other words, if you live in a homogeneous environment in a heterogeneous state, you're probably more likely to, to not cope with that very well and to respond in ways that are, that are, that are sort of rooted in some, some level of racial hostility. Well, there are some questions to be answered, right? Okay, we won with the poorly educated. I love the poorly educated, all right? What are, what are we to make of that? Uh, then we have the quote from uh, Schumer. Democrats blew the opportunity the American people gave them in 2008. Well, that's sort of stunning, okay, given that he's the main champion holding the ACA uh, together these days. Um, but it raises these questions. Have the Republicans become the permanent party of the solid South? Is that their new, um, their new situation? Uh, can the affinity between the Republican Party and populism survive, between white populists and the Republican Party? Uh, does Senator Schumer's observation really point toward the future of the Democratic Party, this party that all of a sudden finds itself primarily reliant on white, well-educated people? Uh, have Democrats become the party of the well-educated? Um, what's the future of social welfare policy in American politics in an environment where we have competing populists with very different inclinations about what populism means for social policy and particularly for social welfare policy inside the United States? Okay. Any questions? Comments? Yes. Well, I think he just came out with the polling results, and that was one of the polling results. Sorry. We'll go with the mic. So just raise your hand and we'll run over. Yeah, my name is Larry Harris. I may have a kind of convoluted question, but let's see if I can get it out. Uh, you know, with knowledge that Trump lies every day, you know, over 2,000 lies for the last year, and having the Citizen United uh, went through the uh, Supreme Court, and uh, then looking at other factors, you know, like um, you know, the cheating, voter ID, extreme gerrymandering, and then and expunging the uh, voting list, uh, making it difficult for people to vote. Uh, how big a part? You know, I maybe I should throw in Russia. <laughs> there seems to be some real connections uh, with that. So, so how big a part do you think? This played in Trump uh, getting a, getting elected, and why doesn't it seem like people are overly concerned when when they you know there have been many many articles about this. Uh, it seems like we, we just morally are you know are depleted as a nation. So I just want to know how you feel about. It. 
how do you, how you think that? You know, I, I think it's hard to explain. I mean, I, th I think, you know, from a sort of a viewpoint of sort of saying, well, what's a rational thing to do? You don't necessarily come up with the result that we ended up with. Um, I've got a brother who gave up on his life in Los Angeles at one point about 20 years ago and moved to Nebraska and bought a beef farm, and so he runs beef in Nebraska. And I talked to him on the phone. I was a little worried, you know. I mean, he's in Nebraska. <laughs> and, uh, and so he said to me, he, I, I said, well, how's it going, Eldon? You know, uh, he said, it's going fine. He goes, except that all my neighbors are voting for Trump. He goes, I keep telling them that they're going to kill the, the export markets for cattle and grain if they do this. And he said, but they don't care. They just keep doing it, you know. So, you know, people, don't re people reason through these problems not irrationally, I don't mean that, but they reason through the problems in, the, in, in, the, uh, in a prism, you know, the, the prism that they see the world in. And there's a lot of scapegoating that goes on. There's a lot of denial that goes on. And, and you know, I'm guilty of it too. I mean, I'm not claiming that I see everything objectively and that, you know, I have my own partisan biases and my own set of preferences I bring to the, to the forefront. We have colleagues in political science that say that's the way voters work, okay? Um, so we shouldn't necessarily be surprised, I think, that there's, um, a, 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 when we see this sort of inconsistencies, these sort of inconsistencies happening, um, it's certainly not new. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to like it, of course. Okay, one on your left, Bob. Thank you, Darian Delu. I just wondered, uh, seeing such a correspondence between opposition to the ACA and support for Trump, would you say that's because the ACA represents a social welfare uh, initiative, or how do you connect that? Well, I, you know, I, I think Schumer put his finger on something that was really important, and that is how hard it is to get to convince even liberals, okay, that they should support social should support um, the ACA. It almost has to be an ideological issue. Let me just show you. Okay, the CCES survey, the one I was using, shows that 8% of the population of respondents is uninsured, okay? Um, that coincides almost exactly with the Kaiser Family Foundation for 2016. That their numbers are the same, that it's about 8%. And then based on the survey data, about 10% of the respondents purchase their own insurance, and of those who purchase, 39% use the ACA, okay? So there's this population of folks that aren't insured, maybe 8%. And then you end up with about 4% of the population that purchase insurance through the exchanges, right? So that's a small percentage of the population, basically. And one of the advantages that Franklin Roosevelt had is when he installed um, you know, collective bargaining rights through the Wagner Act for American laborers, okay, there were huge armies of people that were affected by that. I mean, when you adopted social policy, they had this universalistic sort of Na nature out. I mean, all, everybody was affected. You know, it, it made everybody's lives better, right? So now um, you end up with a relatively small proportion of the population. And I, I'm not in, I don't think Schumer was trying to say we shouldn't do this. Schumer's just saying this is a tough nut to crack, okay? And the tough, it's a tough nut because it, you're not talking about a huge proportion of the population that are getting the benefit, number one. And number two, it's not, um, uh, a lot of people are already covered in some particular way. So I, I, I actually talked to the city editor of the D and tried to get the source, and I can't find it. She couldn't find it for me, and we worked on it. But, but there was a town hall meeting that Dan Lundgren ran when he was congressman out in uh, the western suburbs. And um, it was about ACA. And everybody hated ACA, and everybody was up in arms, and everybody was concerned about it. And this reporter, this enterprising reporter afterwards, she started interviewing people afterwards and find out their position. Well, everybody was opposed to it. And then she'd say, well, where do you get your insurance? And they would say, well, I get my insurance from the VA. Where do you get your insurance? Well, I get my insurance from my employer. Where do you get your insurance? I mean, the point is, everybody's covered, OK? Everybody's got this worked out somehow. And they, and you know, their hearts aren't quite big enough, OK, to figure out that, number one, we should make sure everybody's covered, OK? But number two, and equally compelling, you know, set aside humanitarian instincts, right? This is no way to run a national health We have a national health care plan, and part of it comes from Lister Hill. Lister Hill and uh, Harold Burton were two congressmen 
one was in the House and Hill was in the Senate, and they passed the famous Hill-Burton Act, okay, when they were in the Senate together, or in the Senate and the House together. The Hill-Burton Act provided money for, um, um, to construct hospitals. But any hospital that was constructed with Hill-Burton money has to have a plaque somewhere in the hospital that says no one can be turned away from this hospital due to an inability to pay, okay? That's our national health care insurance, right? If things get really bad and you show up at the emergency room door, they can't turn you away. Okay? But that's, a, that's not the way to run a health care system. There's no preventative health care. There's no health care maintenance. There's, you know, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't turn the trick, right? But we're still stuck with this position where if we got this, really, a health care program plan, plan, in quotes, okay, that's working for a lot of people in a lot of situations, but we haven't sort of quite figured out the way to get it done completely, and we're not talking about a huge proportion of the American population to get covered. So that's kind of the irony of this, I think. This is fascinating. I'm wondering if there's, or if anybody is looking at a correlation between what seems to be the divisiveness between, uh, you know, what's happening with populism and, and the anger and, and what's happened in how we communicate. Things that have changed with the media and the elimination of, uh, and somebody can remind me what they are, of the idea of fairness in, in media presentation, um, as well as consolidation, that sort of thing. Do you, have you looked into that aspect? Well, I mean, certainly you don't have to be a political scientist to see how divisive things have become in terms of the media and the newspapers and everything else. And I, you know, I'm sort of, I mean, the, the level of discourse has sort of gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. 